So this is the first of Meredith's Library Lounge, um, which is a new experimental podcast we are trying at the Meredith Public Library. Each month we will open with an update on happenings at the library, introduce our guests, um, then delve into a topic of interest to our hosts and the broader Meredith uh, community. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce my co-host, Linda Huff who is Hello. also the editor and general creative force behind this podcast. So thank you for that and take it away. All right, what are we doing? Library happenings? So, all right. So currently they're doing uh, a lot of drywalling today. They're gonna break through between the expansion and the old building pretty soon. There is a new interview up on our website, our YouTube and our Facebook uh, interview with Ernie of Milestone uh, engineering with Aaron, getting everyone all up to date on the construction project. Um, we have two upcoming adult programs, uh, specifically two book groups, Mapping of Love and Death by Jacqueline Winspear, March 11th. That's Matthew's uh, Mystery Book Club. And then The Alice Network by Kate Quinn, March 25th. That's Aaron's Brown, book, Brown Bag Book Club. So look those up and join. Today we have a special guest. We're talking about tabletop RPGs and all that uh, all that that entails. Our special guest is Jim Knoll from Hi. the faraway land of California. And it's warm here. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we don't have that so much. No. Yesterday and it approached almost warm, which was 40. I didn't need a jacket. I was fine. All right. And then, of course, we have Matthew, head of circulation. And we're all nerds here, so let's go. Okay. So as Linda mentioned, today we are discussing role-playing games. Um, in general, there are three broad categories of role-playing games, digital RPGs, live action RPGs, and paper and pen RPGs. Um, all of those could easily encompass multiple podcasts and likely there are podcasts about each of those which do just that. Um, today we are just discussing um, what is called paper and pen Dungeons and Dragons, though I would say that most of us have not actually done so with a paper and pen in some time, um, particularly given the current state of the world. Um, so the concept of role-playing games is pretty broad. Um, Dungeons and Dragons is the one that I think people are most familiar with, but it's by no means the entire breadth of the system. Um, some are more complicated systems than Dungeons and Dragons, which uses a 20-sided die for most of its chance rolls. Um, there are other game systems which use a 100-sided die. Um, a couple examples of those are Unknown Armies and Warhammer Fantasy. Then there are games that use exclusively six-sided dice. Um, a few examples of those are GURPS, which Jim will talk about, um, Powered by the Apocalypse games, and Forged in the Dark games. Um, so if at this point you want to mention something about GURPS, um, your experience with it, what you like about the system, anything like that? Oh, yeah. Um... Like comparing GURPS with Dungeons and Dragons or just the system in general? Whatever you would like. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I, I've been in, in two uh, major GURPS campaigns and, uh, you know, they're, they're both, you know, they were both fantasy based uh, systems or settings, I should say. Um, but GURPS itself is actually like a, a universal role-playing system. So it can do anything from cavemen to transhumanist space operas and uh, everything in between. Uh, and its rule system supports all of those kind of styles of play. And so I always find the system really, really interesting, especially when you start mixing and matching those things. So uh, if you ever want to play an RPG, where it doesn't fit neatly into a box. Like you want to do Dungeons and Dragons, but also with, uh, with guns and uh, spaceships, you know, flying around. Then, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, like there is like Spelljammer, which is, you know, something that is sort of like that. But um, GURPS will definitely support any sort of wild flight of fancy. 
Uh, I like yeah. that it's so versatile. Uh, just yeah, it, shared it, with it's me. pretty fun. Yeah, I was I was bored, so I did the math of how many wizards would it take to send uh, the Enterprise into warp, and inversely, <laughs> how many wizards could tap into the power of the warp core of the Enterprise. What were the results? Uh, lots. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. The specificity is great. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, you don't want me to bring up the spreadsheets for that. <laughs> Perhaps uh, not. Perhaps another time. Yes. One of the main reasons I wanted to bring it up because it's, it's not as well known, and I just wanted to highlight ones that weren't just D&D that most people are familiar with. So I think it's great to bring up those other systems, especially since something like GURPS is so versatile like that. And I think another advantage of um, some of the less no well-known games is they often will have fewer books that you necessarily need to purchase for them. Um, like GURPS, I believe you can play a pretty wide array of games with just the initial source book. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas Dungeons and Dragons, in general, they recommend you have at least the three primary books, which on average can run you over $100. So it's not necessarily a cheap hobby. Um, and again, being able to create adventures that are as divergent as space operas and fantasy games, um, and like even noir detective games, I think you could pretty easily create in a GURP setting. Um, Be so into that. That's definitely an advantage of it. And I think it's something, I think role-playing games, people generally think of this is going to be a fantasy Tolkien-esque type world that you enter into. And I definitely think that um, in general, role-playing has a lot more to offer. Um, I would, I have always enjoyed my experiences in a very Tolkien-esque type world. Um, but I think that it is great that you can be a role-player without um, confining yourself to that specific environment. Um, some of the other games I mentioned um, work off of different worlds and some of them are created off of different um, fantasy or science fiction um, novels or in the case of Warhammer, a, I believe the first thing to come out of Warhammer is the tabletop game. Um, so all of these different um, creations of fiction that you can participate in and broaden sort of the world, not just on your own writing fan fiction, which is also a perfectly great thing to do, um, but by experiencing it with your friends and creating a world that is sort of unique to that experience. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of Thanks. philosophical meandering, and I apologize <laughs> for that. No, that's good. <clears throat> That's what you say is the biggest, because uh, you both, I've, I've only played digitally and virtually, so even before the, the COVID thing. So um, what would you say is the biggest drawbacks, pros and cons between the two different ways of playing? Um, well, let's see the different pros and cons. Well, definitely there's a certain visceral enjoyment over rolling dice. The, the physically picking them up, rolling them. Yeah, we got some uh, got some dice over here. He's gonna flex on me with his dice now. <laughs> no, Being I'm just able to out see one. your friends physically watch your amazing dice rolls, or oh, yeah. as often you your phone. My video is being funny. Um, yeah, but you just pick them up. You roll them across the table. Up, dice bounces around. Everyone goes to look at the results and oohs and yeah. ahs or cringes or cheers. Um, you know, and like physically holding all the little pieces and stuff is definitely, uh, I think it's part of the enjoyment of the hobby. And that's the biggest part that you lose going digitally. Um, yeah, I never thought of like everyone leaning over to see the result like expectantly. Oh, yeah, it's, it's definitely the, the fun part. And so it's, that's why it's always suspicious whenever someone rolls it and they're like covering up the results. Like, oh, yeah. I've never done. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, um, I just dropped two and lost them on the floor. I'll get them after this podcast. I think another um, thing that is very different in 
online versus in-person play is the timing of things, which I think that's true of most experiences um, in Zoom, like whether it's a board meeting or gaming, um, you have to sort of wait for different signals from the people you're playing with um, to realize, okay, now it's my time to talk. Um, and I think the general group size, there are definitely different elements in virtual versus in-person play. Um, and just to be clear, I'm saying with in-person play, generally something like a Zoom environment combined with um, some of the online tools, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, that exists to incorporate the roles in. Um, but there are also games where you literally post once a week, and that's what your character does, and um, there's no real-time actual interaction. Um, and that's not something I've ever done, but I know there are adventures that have played out literally for months um, with just that limited sort of interaction. Um, and I think that that ability to um, go across both time and space um, with your interactions with other people is a great opportunity, but it definitely is a different experience than um, in-person um, conversations that are going on in real time. Yeah, I've never used Zoom for, because you'd have to have a pro account if you're going over 40 hours. Uh, mostly use Discord for that. Yeah, uh, so I guess Discord is one definite resource um, to playing. Um, are there, either A, do you want to talk a little bit about what Discord is for those who are unfamiliar? <laughs> and B, do we want to go into some of the other resources that are out there um, for online play? Because at least at yeah. the moment, I think that is basically the majority of role playing that's going to be taking place. Yeah, Discord is just a, uh, how do you explain it? It's a chat program. It's a chat uh, program. It has video, has yeah. audio. I usually use a conjunction with the like Roll20 is what I've used. Yeah, Although there's D&D &D Beyond and Foundry. But um, so we're usually all in the Discord talking while we have Roll20 up, which is uh, a forum within where you can play D&D &D or anything. Um, uh, I've never been a GM, so I can't explain how it works on that end. But as a player, it's really cool. You digitally roll your die and it has maps and everything. Um, I've never used D&D &D Beyond or Foundry, but D&D &D Beyond seems to be really good with like creating character sheets and stuff. Um, anything to add, Jim? Uh, as, as far as virtual tabletops go? Yeah, um, yeah I've used uh, Roll20 and Foundry and Tabletop Simulator. All, they all have their own pros and cons to uh, uh, running the game. Um, Do they all have free versions or... Uh, no, they, they, they all have different models. So Roll20 is like if you're definitely playing on a budget, um, as in free, then Roll20 is available and it will, it'll do for a free game. Um, I, I like Foundry's model. Um, one person just buys a license to run the game, uh, which is like 50 bucks, and then everyone else can join their game for free. So only one person needs to buy it. So like, and if once you, you bought that license, is it free or is it a subscription service? It's it's a one time purchase. Uh, Roll Twenty has a subscription service to give you more features, um, and so uh, there's different like minutia of pros and cons of between uh, Roll Twenty and and Foundry. Um, virtual uh, Tabletop Simulator is just a more generic thing, uh, which you can use to play role-playing games with. Uh, everyone needs to own a copy of it, so, you know. And that's on Steam and, and Yeah, so, so like four or five person group, you get it on sale for $10, and then that's $50 there for everyone. Um, and yeah, and it's, it's 3D, so if you want like a 3D environment rather than like a 2D environment, um, that'd be good, and it's also, useful for playing other board games too. So uh, yeah, overall it's, yeah. I, I definitely prefer Tabletop Simulator or 
Foundry to Roll20, personally. What was the one we were using? Because we recently did a game together. Uh, was it for Genesis? Yeah, um, we were yeah, we were going to use uh, Foundry, but, uh, you know, things happened and the game didn't pan it out. So, hey, kitty cat. <gasps> Nico, this is Matthew's kitty cat. Hi. Oh, my God, she looks... <laughs> she looks... I don't know what she looks like. Who's to say what goes on in that mind? Um, so, I have only done um, D&D Beyond for online... Um, game simulators and that works well because one of the people in our group has paid the subscription for it for a year. Um, it does definitely have a free version um, and the resources you get for the paid version I think provide a fair amount. Um, like I'm not the owner of the license but I can still create a campaign on it um, and have a certain number of characters, I believe it's six or something active at one time, um, have a number of encounters preloaded onto it. Um, and then it links with different resource books in Dungeons and Dragons. So if you're in interested in spending extra money on it, um, you can get a lot of the content digitally exclusively um, versus having to buy those physical books and everyone in that campaign would have access to them. So it definitely has its advantages. Obviously it's exclusive to Dungeons and Dragons 5e. Um, and I don't know that if I had been the person responsible for paying for it, I would have gone that route versus Roll20 or Tabletop Simulator. Um, the fact that it is a subscription, so you have it for a year and then you have to decide if it's worth re-upping. Um, We'll see how that goes. And obviously you can pool resources, um, but it is a different model as well. I haven't used that one. I made a little free account and kind of played around with the character sheet, which is kind of cool, but that's all I've done there. I know it's mentioned a lot in Critical Role, which is a podcast where you can um, listen to them play. And it's, uh, it's their yeah. sponsor. So I, I always like hear it in my head over and over again. Uh, yeah, I have a few friends that have bought a lot of books on D&D uh, &D Beyond and made a campaign, invited all their friends to make characters for that mm -hmm. campaign. So you can basically use it as a big encyclopedia at that point, um, which I highly recommend having rich friends that buy stuff. <laughs> um, Everyone should have lots of those. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so like then, then it's a pretty useful website because then you can just sort of start looking up all your spells and equipment and magic items and class abilities. And it's like, Oh yeah, it's pretty useful at that point. Yeah. And I also have been looking at like, you can also create items or encounters or monsters or character classes and they get saved to your profile. Um, you can, if they're sufficiently different and fit whatever their criteria are, they can be published, but even just having the non-published homebrew, elements of it, I think is a useful feature. Um, so do we want to talk a little bit about um, character experience, whether it's creating a character, playing a character, what that sort of has been from our different perspectives? Yeah, I can talk about what got me into it. Um, the first, my first experience was probably around 2014. Um, I really love the Dragon Age universe and there is a Dragon Age tabletop. Um, I'll put a link to that in the notes. Um, so my friend Sam set up an online game on Roll20, and he's an artist and everything. Um, and he did this from Japan at the time, so we were our, our time zones were all over the place. I played with someone from Scotland, someone from Wales, me, California. So that was a little like a scuttling cat around, cats around. But um, uh, so yeah, that was my first experience. I played a chase and car character I named Saskia, who I really loved, and. Um, eventually sharing the nickname Saskia the Reckless because I'm a really reckless player. I make, I make impulsive decisions. Um, I basically play myself. <laughs> um, and it ran for two to three years. And it was really fun. My first roll ever, we got a loot box and um, I hit the roll and I have a little picture of this that I can share. Um, and everyone's getting the really cool loot and I rolled, the, it was random loot. So, and then I rolled and I got a bunch of bees that stung me in the face. So that was fun. Thanks, Sam. Painful. So XO. 
<laughs> Double hundred bees, according to the notes. Yes, yes, because I immediately took a picture of it. And I haven't found my Facebook post where I first talked about it. And Sam's like, I can't believe that was your first role. It's one way to enter <laughs> into the world. Yeah, but I had so much fun. And I just got to show there's there's a lot out there. There's there's one for Dragon Age. I know the one recently came out for the Dishonored video game, if you're into that. So it's really cool. Star Wars, right? Star Wars has one. And Star Wars has a lot. <laughs> yeah. And I think... There are varying degrees of how authorized by whatever um, yeah. fictional work they are, but I think whether it's just a fan base thing, um, I know Scum and Villainy is very heavily influenced by Star Wars, but if you look at like the terminology they use in their source books, they go away from specifically <laughs> saying words like Jedi and Force, uh, for instance. Well, the Dragon Age one is, is, um, is I believe it's licensed. Uh, when I was looking up earlier, I found a video of Will Wheaton talking about it, which is kind of funny. Uh, yeah, yeah. He actually was instrumental in making the generic version of the uh, Dragon Age RPG. So yeah, I, I freaked so If out. you like the system, you can play it um, just like with any fantasy setting. It's called Fantasy Age. And uh, there Wesley is Wesley Crusher, man. He always always finds a way to save the day. Yeah. So there's the Fantasy Age <laughs> book. <laughs> ah, you have one. Oh, so yeah. Cool. And the, the, there's this setting that he made called Titan's Grave for it. Nice. See, I didn't know that because Neo Sam had all the material. It's a good system. Also, that's probably before. I only saw where he started Trek this year. I, I didn't know who Will Wheaton was. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> he is fairly active in both role playing and board game communities um, post Star Trek, so he's had a whole second, um, yeah, I knew his I'm name, sure, or third phase of his career, whatever. It, <laughs> um, it feels like third phase at this point. <laughs> um, so I would say that I have been a player far more than a DM, which is. Um, Dungeon Master, which is the common parlance in Dungeons and Dragons, or the more general term GM for Game Master, um, which is used um, in a variety of games. Many will have their own little um, takes off of what that is. Storyteller, a popular yeah. one. Um, a game called um, what is it? It has. I could go back to the bookshelf behind me and actually find it, but it uses the term seneschal, which is like your butler. <laughs> it's kind of like, that's a very weird thing for a <laughs> fantasy fight game, but sure. That's a I'll very specific term. Too. Yeah. Um, so what I was going to say about, um, I guess what I enjoy about being a player is that you can take on a persona very different from your own um, and sort of see where that leads you interacting with other people who are doing the same. And I think like you get interesting perspectives on those people based on them playing personas that are not themselves. Um, like there are definitely things that are actually you that come out in a character. Um, I guess the biggest thing for me is I tend to be charismatic and boisterous characters, and I am neither of those things in real life. What? What? <laughs> like, I can't believe it. Shocking, I know. Um, <clears throat> but I think like that does create cool tension um, in a campaign where like maybe you're someone who takes five minutes to come up with a decision and your character is assuredly not. So you have to try and like exist in the space where you're being super impulsive and not um, questioning every choice from every angle. Um, I know in a recent campaign I was playing, I had to act as a character, as a guard while being my character who is a bard um, <laughs> and attempting a deception and um, trying to figure out, okay, this is how I'm going to play this guard's backstory up um, because I imagine it's probably how he interacts with these other guards and to get the advantage that my bard needs so that my 
player experience can arrive at whatever our goal is. Um, it was interesting and odd and fun uh, and involved that poor guard getting into a lot of trouble when his uh, people actually saw him again, I'm sure. But I wasn't oh there God. for that. You are Clayface in the Harley Quinn DC animated series on HBO Max right now. I'll take your word for that. I um, always end up playing myself, man. Just, just do. So I feel like um, I'd like to hear a bit about GMing, creating worlds, creating scenarios. Um, if you have, um, Jim, you might have the most experience with <laughs> yeah, he does in that world. So um, <laughs> if you could just give us a brief, these are the cool things about doing that and everyone should totally be a GM or a DM. Looking at you, uh, Linda. Yes, everyone should definitely <laughs> be a... Uh, Okay, so uh, making a, a world. Um, yeah, so definitely everyone should be a, a, a GM at some time, uh, mostly so that I have plenty of games I can join. Um, but yeah, um, there's like lots of different approaches and methods to creating a world. Um, and it, it really varies from person to person how you do it because everyone just has their own strengths and weaknesses and stuff. Like I can run, uh, I can just make up a guard for the characters to interact with on the fly. And they seem to really enjoy these characters, but then it's like, Oh, uh, he needs a name. I was like, Oh, Oh, where's the name? <laughs> <laughs> the name generator. His name is you, you fancy Timothy. name generator. It's, it's bookmarked. You know, I donate to that website. <laughs> <laughs> this is Bimothy the guard. Um, yeah. Okay, coming up with names. Bim and his brother, Bomothy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, in general, um, you start with some vague idea. Like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if there's a world where such and such happened? Hey, wouldn't it be cool if there's a world where, like, instead of horses, like, your characters ran around, like, rode around on motorcycles and, like, still hit each other with swords? Yeah, that'd be <laughs> awesome. And you just, you just work off that. Um, Hardcore jousting there. Yeah. Yeah. W wouldn't you, don't you want to play in the game where there's, a, there's guys jousting on motorcycles? <laughs> Totally. Casting spells. I, think I saw that eighties movie. So uh, they, they stand on the back of uh, Mel Gibson in bar, you know, and like start throwing spells at other people. Um, yeah, but like you can do like uh, I think there's two major thoughts on how to world build, which is either top down or bottom up. Uh, top down is where you. Uh, uh, you start on the grand scale of things like, okay, here's like a planet and some continents. And then you sort of zoom in like more and more on one, one spot until you're ready to start a campaign. Um, and there's bottom up where you, you just start with a town like, all right, well, is there a neighboring town? Uh, sure. Uh, you know, who's in charge of these? Like, oh, count. The count has sworn fealty to this king. And then so you see you build up and up and up from a, a small starting point and they're both useful depending on how large of a scope you want your game to be. So if you're just doing like a real quick game like takes place in a town, you only need to really build a town. It's true. So something um, I have enjoyed and I think the term comes from the game called Burning Wheel, um, but it's called World Burning where um, not only the DM, but the players also are involved in sort of like that first setup thing where um, you ask, okay, what are elements that you want to see in this world? Um, and I think some game systems, that's easier to work out than others. Um, I think like Burning Wheel is sort of built on that concept where this is my character, these are his views and convictions, and this is the world sort of I want to exist in. And then the three or four characters in that system, as well as the game master sort of build up from that point and sort of create a world from there. Um, but in Dungeons and Dragons, I feel like 
there's a lot of time the DM has to put into it between sessions um, where he needs, he or she needs to like view, okay, what am I going to do to create these scenarios and how I need to have an idea for if they go left or right in this cave um, and maybe they don't ever see this whole thing I put a fair amount of time into, but I need it to sort of, I need some amount of there to be something behind that door. Um, do you think that is a challenge as a game master or is it not something you really encounter a lot of? Uh, I mean, I've, I've done entire dungeons just sort of on the fly. Uh, you know, they just, the players just need to be entertained for, you know, three hours and I can, I can do that sometimes. Um, but there is definitely a, um, a change in like philosophy and how games are played all older games from the eighties to the two thousands, I'd say had um, like for Dungeons and Dragons were um, there was a lot more emphasis on basically the players make characters to go into a world and like they're plopped into a dungeon and then the the dungeon master is then the referee for the interactions within that dungeon. Whereas there's now more emphasis on story and, and like characters and their interactions with the world, which in turn makes systems that empower players to also influence the world and the world building a whole lot more. Um, there's like entire like GM less RPG systems now. Um, uh, I don't know if you would really consider them to be like ar like long term RPGs, but there's like Fiasco and uh, Quiet Year is more like a board game, but it has a lot, feels like an RPG a whole lot. And um, oh, there was one other one I can't think of right now, um, but yeah, where there's just people are. Uh, yeah, much more like encouraged. Gloomhaven might be similar to that as well. Yeah, yeah, Gloomhaven is. I would say that's more of a board game, personally. He's playing um, that right now. I mean, it definitely has elements of RPGs to it, but yeah, yeah, I, I've been agree. playing Gloomhaven, and like you, there's decisions where you can either help someone or attack somebody. You know, like who who are you going to team up with, and that will drastically change the face of the board game itself because you had little stickers and everything and open up compartments based on your decisions. Um, and so, yeah, that's definitely like a, it's more of a board game, but it's definitely like a role playing game without any uh, game master. And I guess like there are a good number of role playing games that don't involve like a lot of setup to them. Um, like, Monster of the Week, um, Blades in the Dark, those sort of things. Potentially, the DM can be coming into it at the same point as the players, like building it on the fly. Um, and I think with D and D, that is more challenging. But it's also definitely possible that you can sort of make these encounters on the fly because ultimately the goal is for everyone at the table to have a good time. And I use table mm -hmm. um, figuratively. Yeah. Uh, but. Um, and I think you can arrive at that enjoyment in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think the system is supposed to help facilitate that. Um, and dependent on what the people in the group are looking for, there are different systems that do a better job of facilitating things. Um, but I think, I don't think there's necessarily a perfect system or I would say in general, most terrible systems are just systems that don't fit what sort of stories the people at that table want to do? Um, what I found is that there are systems that I really enjoy playing in and there's systems that I really enjoy running. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, it all just sort of depends on, on tools. Like I don't mind playing like a Pathfinder game or, or, or I really enjoy playing in GURPS, but I don't think I'd ever run a game of GURPS. It looks like a lot of... Uh, can be a lot of work to run a game <laughs> of GURPS. But like Dungeons and Dragons, it feels like the easiest system to run for me. Uh, fifth edition, I should say. 
as opposed to third edition. And would you say um, that's primarily because you have a ton of experience with it or just that the, the by rule... the fifth iteration, they've done a good job of making it very accessible, which like, I suppose Wizards of the Coast wants it to be as accessible as possible to have as large a market as they can possibly have. Um, I, I wouldn't don't mean say to be it's overly because... cynical in that statement. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's because of the tools of fifth edition. It's just like the mechanics of fifth edition are very intuitive and like the math that's involved is really, really straightforward. Um, I mean, you can just put together some monsters like, all right, they're good at this thing. They have a plus five and, and doing smart things. And then like a minus one doing muscle things. Sure. You just write that down real fast. Like how hard is it? I don't know. You can just write down a number. How does he get to that number? That doesn't matter in fifth edition. Um, and then you just write down three abilities that he has, and the monster probably won't live for that long. So then you're good. You can just make, make stuff up while the players are deciding their turns. You just add more abilities. <laughs> this would be cool. Yeah. Doesn't do that next round. Or at the very least, just more hit points so he's not dead quite as quickly. So he <laughs> can hold up the fort for a little longer. Uh, you forgot about his twin brother in the next room, <laughs> Obert. <laughs> uh, just don't invite me to consult on your game because it will become the French Revolution. Yeah, it did become the French Revolution. Um, it did. Yeah, and yeah, Genesis, which is the generic version of the Star Wars Edge of the Empire game. Uh, I also really enjoy running that game, um, and. Because it uses these special dice that are constantly prompting you to add more things to the scene. The die were really cool. That was my favorite part about it. Yeah. Um, I, I know, what I did for that game is I ran a Dungeons and Dragons like, module, like one, one adventure thing. It took several sessions to get through it. And um, uh, what it taught me is that Genesis is much more about having a big cinematic fight rather than like you go into this room. And there's three guys to fight, and then you go in the next room. There's there's four different guys to fight there. Yeah, I would um, say one thing <laughs> when um, playing different games is like learning that there are some things one game does well and another yeah. game does really badly. Like I feel like porting a lot of Dungeons and Dragons elements into like a real world um, supernatural horror type game makes things challenging because there are consequences to murdering hundreds of things yeah. uh, that may not exist in a D and D world. <laughs> yeah. But I will say that, that I'm going to bring up, I'm going to bring it up when I jumped on the bed and did a twirl and grab that jewel. My favorite moment. One of my favorite oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I can't speak from the player's perspective though. <laughs> they seem to enjoy the final boss fight in that one dungeon when they grabbed all their treasures and they had to get the treasures, you know, back home, they went through like this one highly guarded mountain pass city that, um, that is enacting taxes and tariffs on treasure going through it. And so they, oh, yeah. they spent, you know, a whole session planning <laughs> how to smuggle it in through that system through their entire system and they got pulled over by the guards for a random inspection and uh you know and had this role-playing scene where they're like passing things like behind each other's backs and <laughs> that kind of stuff metaphorically um and and they really really enjoyed that so it's just sort of like oh like in D Dungeons and Dragons that would have been like a five minute thing and here it was like this two session long nail biter <laughs> suspense thriller um just because of how the system runs so it was fun it was yeah. fun what did we turn them into oh you turned them into like, like turnips like turnips yeah <laughs> they, had, you know, they had all these gems and treasures and they disguised them as turnips we put some real turnips on the tops in case they try to like take take a yeah. bite or something yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which happened i guess they would thank you for that after a fashion, yeah. biting into Maybe. a jewelry might not be the most oh, comfortable thing to do. Um, yeah, we should probably. I think so we're, we're way over time. time. Uh, <laughs> I would like to know um, if 
there are any sort of media out there that you are interested in with regards to role playing. Um, so for me, um, I wanted to at least plug one podcast I listen to, um, which is run by um, a friend of a friend of mine, um, Judd Carlman, and it's called Daydreaming About Dragons. And he is a longtime GM, um, and he basically has these 15-minute sessions where he will talk about different elements in um, GMing. The one that I really remember is he was talking about fudging dice rolls, which particularly as a GM, do you make the decision that you roll the 20 and so the goblin has killed one of the players? Um, do you want that to stick or do you then go back and say, well, I may have rolled a 20. He doesn't need to roll it. No, I rolled a 20. DMs have these things called DM screens, so you can't actually see what I roll. Um, so maybe he didn't roll a 20. And he t sort of takes the stance that, no, if you're rolling these dice, you want people to deal with these consequences. So maybe the hero of legend gets killed by a goblin and the rest of the campaign is figuring out what does that mean to this world? Um, so sort of following the interesting things that can come from narrative just being screwed over um, by the <laughs> role of dice. Um, so I really enjoy that. Um, but do the two of you have any media that um, speaks to you as far as role playing? Well, they're the big ones, Critical Role, The Adventure Zone, which we do have some books of in the um, graphic uh, novel section of the teen room. That's what I've got. <laughs> Otherwise, I, I mostly just like to play it. Uh, my personal favorite uh, media that I consume is uh, Matt Colville's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, he's been running games for forever, and he'll just, whenever he runs a game, he'll, like, make a thing, like, this is something I learned, and, like, tips for other people and, and stuff. Uh, he hasn't been doing it as much because of COVID. Um, but yeah, I always enjoy his videos. Um, there's another channel, I believe it's called Hello Future Me, which does a whole lot of world building videos, which is uh, pretty interesting. Great. Cool. cool. So um, I didn't want to bring up, Matthew, what you were talking about, the fudging the dice roll, uh, the hero dying, and then it about being the fallen. It reminded me of that book that you read, The Right of the Fallen, was it called? Fate of the Fallen, I think, yeah. Um, yeah, we could. I just saw it on my way upstairs because it's on my staff picks. Uh, yeah. For, uh, yeah. Shelf. So, this is another one you can check out at the Meredith Library. Woo! So cool. Thanks for joining us, Jim. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me. Yeah, that was fun. So, um, everybody, just let us know what you think, what you want to see in the future. Um, share your own DD experiences, and yeah. I think in the future we'll try to keep these a little bit shorter, but yeah, we'll yeah. see how it all works out. Uh, Especially if Zoom starts charging me. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. That would be ideal. Yeah, just let us know what you want to see. If you enjoyed this one, what would you like? What would you would like? English. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.